Good morning, you guys. How are you doing this morning? Yeah, great. Great. We just experienced a monumental moment together, and you might not even know it. But that was our final kid front moment in the history of the Front Church. Because next week, when the kids get checked in, they're going to go straight back to the summit. And they're going to sing their songs, and they're going to hear about Jesus in age-appropriate ways. And so that's happening next week week we've come from handing out coloring pages to the kids when they come here to having a kid front moment to now having having kid front moment and kids go back after the moment to next week that's a huge growth growth step for us so give it up for that that's that's a big deal um if we haven't met my name is nate and i am the lead pastor of the front church and if you're new if you're from another tradition if you're not particularly religious, we're just so glad to have you. I guarantee there's other folks who fit that description besides yourself uh, this morning. Uh, we are, I'm getting a lot of questions recently about what does it mean that we're in the preseason? If you've hung out with us a few times, you know that every Sunday I say, well, we're in the preseason, but our grand opening is coming. And people are, well, what's, what's different? Well, our grand opening is going to be Sunday, September 12th. That's the Sunday after Labor Day. And so in the preseason, there's, there's several things that are different. The auditorium, this space is going to be different. It's going to look a little bit more like that. You can see that. And then we have the barren wasteland that you walk through. We're going to transform that area over there to our cafe where people can grab a cup of coffee They can chat for a minute before coming over here. We're going to radically transform. We're already radically transforming one room for Kid Front. But we're going to radically transform several rooms back in the hallway for Kid Front. Because we think that kids are the most important ministry at the Front Church. We don't think kids are like second class and then us grown-ups get to do the real stuff. Like, no, kids are where it's at. We like grown-up stuff too, but we make sure that that is the most important space and place. Our goal is that your kids leave crying, not because they're, they're, they had an awful time, but because they don't want to leave. That's our goal. And so some people might say, well, why? Why all the effort to transform this space, to transform that space? To, that's going to require a lot more manpower. That's going to require a lot more people to transform the, this space into where we're headed, the kid front stuff. Why the effort? Here's why. Because we want people to come, and then we want people to come back. We want people to come and be like, huh? We want people to come back because they had a good time. Because we think that people hearing about Jesus and experiencing Jesus' story is the most important thing for someone's life. The most important thing. Music's going to look different. Uh, Right now, most Sundays, it's kind of a stripped-down affair where Cam is leading us or one of our other worship leaders is leading us. In September, we're going to have a full band week in and week out. My messages are going to look a little different. Right now, my messages are kind of a hybrid between some Bible teaching, but also, and maybe you didn't know this till today, so you're in on on the, on the secret now. But my messages are a hybrid of Bible, but also preparing us as a community for our grand opening in the fall. And so right now, we're getting ready. Now, can we still worship? Can we still praise God? Can we still be community? Can we still do all those things in the preseason? Yes, we can. But we're headed somewhere together. And I am praying that on Sunday, September 12th, I believe we'll be far past COVID, at least in our state. Um, We're praying for a full house in here on Sunday, September 12th. And so last week we talked about you should come and how these are three simple words that actually help us as we're seeking to invite people to be a part of what we're doing. So instead of just telling people, well, yeah, on on the weekend I go to the front church. You say on the weekend I go to the front church. You should come. Oh, what do your kids do? Well, my kids really love stuff. 
over here on Sundays, you should come. Like we talked about becoming you should come people. We looked last week at John chapter four and how Jesus was a you should come person. He's always inviting people to come along. And, and this woman, this new friend of his in John chapter four goes from someone who's marked by shame marked by community shame. She has an experience with Jesus and something in her shifts. And she goes back into the community and says, you should come because Jesus changes people. We talk about how Jesus' disciples, they like to, they like to um, assume people's answers for them. Like, oh, those, they'll never come. Those people never come. Those, no way. Those Samaritans, no way. And how Jesus, in the way that he's living, in the way that he's inviting people to come, he's inviting them into a new approach to not write people off. How many people, like, I do this, I write people off. I'm like, no, nah, they're, they're not going to come. So I'm not going to ask them. Why, why do we make excuses for people instead of let, let the people make excuses for themselves? Like, we don't have to make excuses for them. So that's what we talked about last week. But this week I want to talk about what about the people who won't come or say, no, thanks. No, not for me. Um, And for that, I have a question. Do you ever feel like things move a little slower in Utah? People might move a little slower. Uh, If you feel like that, it's because they do. Um, let Let me show you something. I was talking with a marketing friend this week. And he was showing me information about our area. And I want to share a little bit of this with you. Now, blue is Utah, and orange is the national average. And so you can see that Utah is really low and with regard to cultural connection. I'm going to unpack that term in just a minute. Compared to the rest of the country, and really, uh, they're, they're, really, they're, they're really high in low cultural connection, and they're really low in high cultural connection. What's going on there? Well, let's talk about those. Go to the next slide. High cultural connection. This is not, this is not us. This is one in 20 people in, the, in Utah, but this is one in five people in the United States. This is how someone who's marketing would market to someone who has high cultural connection. Give them opportunities to connect with diverse cultures. A brand should acknowledge their uniqueness. Uh, integrate technology into your daily routines. You should offer experiences that stretch people. You should prioritize or, or recognize people's uniqueness. Don't keep people in their comfort zone. Offer new opportunities that, or, or don't offer opportunities that increase financial worries. Just kind of like, basically, these people are ready for a little change and a little risk and a little, a little, some a little different. High cultural connection. Go to low cultural connection. This is one in five people in the country. This is one in two people in Utah. What do, what do they want? Well, they want financial confidence and security. They want to avoid unnecessary risk. They want to keep technology in its place so it doesn't run their lives. So what do you do if you're marketing to these? Well, you provide consistent, familiar sol- solutions. You avoid pushing people into something that is new and they're happy where they are. What you don't do, don't disrupt their routines with technology. Um, don't promote cultural experiences or activities. Go back to this, the, the next slide, go to the next slide. Sorry, I'm sorry, go to the next one, there. We are super high in low cultural connection, which means things do move slow here. People move slow. There's reservations to do something new. We are way more reserved, one in two versus the one in five national average. And people who want to try something new, this is even more relevant, one in 20. One in 20 people are eager to try something new versus one in five nationally. So this means that we got to keep on keeping on. Sometimes we can get discouraged. Oh man, this isn't going as fast as I thought. People aren't showing up like I thought. This is harder than I thought. Where I thought people would show up sooner. I thought this would move faster. And instead, we got to look at our context and realize, oh, people move slow. So we keep on keeping on. So open or turn on your Bibles to the book of Mark. The book of Mark is right after the book of Matthew, right before the book of Luke. 
We're going to go to big number two, Mark, big number two. But before we get there, Mark is a gospel, meaning it's a, it's, it's a biography of Jesus's life. And Mark's gospel is on hyperspeed. So where Matthew, Luke, and John take their precious time and fill out a lot of details, Mark just jumps right in. And in Mark chapter 1, verse 1, he says the beginning of the gospel about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. He's like, here it is. This is the gospel. Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. He just jumps right in. And that's, that's pretty characteristic of his whole thing. His, his gospel moves quick. But we're going to run into a story in Mark chapter 2 that we can learn from this morning. Turns out my bookmark is gone. So I'm flipping right there with you. Mark chapter 2, verse 1. It says, A few days later, Jesus again entered Capernaum, and the people heard that he had come home. And they gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Uh, here's a picture of the Sea of Galilee. Um, and that is right next to Capernaum. And then here's a picture. You might have a little bit of a difficult time seeing it, but, and, and maybe have a hard time with the proportions. But these are ancient ruins of houses in the first century in the time of Jesus. And in Capernaum, these houses were not big. They were small. And they didn't have lots of windows for a breeze. Because if you had lots of windows, then you get lots of rain in your house. And so, so it's crowded, it's stuffy, this house is as packed as it's going to get, and, and, but Jesus is there and something's going on. So verse 3, some men came bringing to Jesus a paralyzed man carried by four of them. And since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the, mat, the mat that the man was lying on. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Um, unlike us, it's not uncommon for people to be on roofs in the first century. It was almost like there were stairs leading up. It's a place to cool down. It's a place to catch a breeze. So these guys just hauling their friend up on the roof, no big deal. But I wonder if Jesus is kind of looking up with his friends and like, there's some dirt falling on us. And like... And, 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 and I wonder what the homeowner, how the homeowner felt uh, when there's a big hole in his roof. But we're, we're, we're going to keep going. We're going to come back to this in a second. Now, some of the teachers of the law were sitting there and they're thinking to themselves, why does Jesus talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? They're upset about Jesus's words. Because they're saying, like, Jesus is putting himself on par with God. Who has the audacity to do that? Mark includes this in his gospel because he wants to tell us Jesus is God. And then Jesus, not only that, but he's subverting their system. Because their system is, if this man wants his sins forgiven, he needs to go to the temple. And at the temple, that's where he can experience the presence of God in all its fullness. And that's where he can get his sins forgiven. And Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. Huh. They're like, you can't do that. We have a process. We have a procedure. But Jesus is claiming to be the place of God's presence here. And saying, I am the place, I am the true temple, and I can say to you, your sins are forgiven. And so they're upset. You know, Jesus is always upsetting the religious leaders of his day, and you know why? Because he keeps insisting that those they say are far from God are not far from God. I like Jesus. Let's keep going. Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts, and he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man, that's Jesus referring to himself, has authority to, on earth to forgive sins. And so he turns to the man and says, I tell you, get up, take your mat, go home. And he got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of all of them. And this amazed everyone. And they praised God saying, we've never seen anything like this. 
This is the biggest point of the whole passage. Don't you like when Jesus makes it easy for us? He's like, here's my point. I said his sins are forgiven. You guys got some questions. I want you to know I can forgive sins. So I'm going to tell him to walk and he's going to walk. Jesus says, this is the point. I can forgive sins. Sometimes I think that um, uh, we can, we can kind of get, it's, it's miraculous what happened. I think sometimes we can get caught up, we can get sidetracked by the miracle and forget the true miracle. Eric Michael Bryant writes this on reflecting about this passage. He says, often we long to experience more than miraculous, wanting to see people healed of their afflictions, even to be healed of our own. In doing so, we overlook and downplay the greatest miracle Christ offered as he walked the earth and the greatest miracle he offers to us all today. What do all those Jesus healed of leprosy, blindness, paralysis, and even death have in common now? They are all dead. But a heart transformed by God lives forever. I believe God is able to do miraculous things. I believe he can still heal people. I believe he can still heal our bodies. I believe that he can do some wild, amazing things. But I think that sometimes we can get so focused on that and we can get sidetracked that the biggest miracle is that Jesus takes the thing that stood in the way of our relationship with God He takes the thing that stood in the way of our access to God's presence. He says, I'm going to take care of that. And that's the thing we need most. Experiencing Jesus' story, an encounter with Jesus, like the woman we heard about last week, like this man this week. The thing we need most is to encounter Jesus, to hear him say, your sins are forgiven. Follow me. And it can be discouraging sometimes when... um, when we begin to realize this and we begin to want this for our friends or want this for people in our lives and they don't really understand that this is a thing that they need or they don't really want it or they're not really interested. And so you know what we gotta do? We gotta do what these friends did and we gotta find ways to get people to Jesus. Look at this, two, four. Back to chapter 2, verse 4. Since they could not get him to Jesus, because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof. Oh, that's so good. I love this verse. Because I think, what if this described us? What if this described Jesus' as people? What if this described us as the front church? Since... They could not get him to Jesus because of blank, because of the crowd. They made an opening. Crowd, no problem. Roof in the way, no problem. People say they won't come, no problem. We're slow movers in Utah. We'll just go to them. There's this thing is moving slower than we thought. No problem. We are people. We are called to be people who, since they couldn't get, since someone couldn't get to Jesus because of this thing, we make an opening. Oh man, these friends knew what their friend needed. They knew. And nothing, no crowd, no roof, nothing was going to get in their way of getting their friend to Jesus. And then you know what happens? Their friend gets to Jesus and his life is turned upside down. Because that's what happens when people get to Jesus. Jesus turns our lives upside down. And I, I think part of my prayer when reading this is like, God, just make us a little crazy like these guys. They were, they were tearing through someone's roof. They were desperate. They're like, we got to get this guy to Jesus. We got to get it because we know what's possible. And I think, God, just make, make me a little crazy. Make us a little crazy. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening. Since we could not get people to Jesus because people are slow movers, we make an opening. Um, One thing, at the Front Church, we will always prepare for company on Sundays. That means we want to be a place where if your neighbors come or you invite your neighbors here, 
We don't want anyone to ever leave thinking, whew, man, I'm glad I didn't invite my neighbors there. Like, we don't want people, people are not coming here for a beatdown. We're coming to introduce Jesus, not to bludgeon them with our, like beat them with our Bibles or something. That's not why we, that's not what we're doing here. We want, we want people to come. And when they leave, we do every, we're working hard to make this a reality with our, with our music, with our messages, with everything. We want people to leave thinking, man, I wish my friend were here. I wish my neighbor had come. I want to invite them next week. That is what we're doing. But the honest reality is some people are 10 steps away from church on Sundays. And that's okay. You know what? Church doesn't stay in the building, y'all. Church leaves the building. God's presence goes with us as his people out of the church. And so what does that mean? That means that if they can't get, if we can't get someone to Jesus because of the crowd or because they're 10 steps away from Sundays, we make an opening. I read something really meaningful a a, a few years ago, and it was that um, most people go through their entire day without one meaningful interaction. They wake up in the morning, they look at their phone, they eat breakfast, they drive to work, they work, they come home, they drive into their garage that's connected to their house, they don't see their neighbors, they eat dinner, they turn on the TV, they watch it for a few hours, they go to bed. And I thought, you know, you know one way that we can take, that, that, that we can make an opening? Be the meaningful interaction in someone's day. You know, you have incredible potential as God's people, God's spirit living in you, that if you say, God, help me see some people and have some interactions, if you do that, God will bless you and you could be the meaningful interaction that someone will otherwise never have. That's one way to make an opening. Here's some more ways to make an opening. Um, I have a, I, I read an author, his name is Sky Jathani. I think if your name, your last name is as cool as Jathani, like, you are just the man. Like, what an awesome name. But anyway, Sky Jathani, he says that our homes are to be hospitals. And our dinner tables are to become operating tables where broken souls are made new. I think that's beautiful. I think, what does it look like to, to, to um, make an opening? Our homes need to be places, not of, yes, it's okay for your home to be refuge. It's okay for your home to be escape. But if your home is just escape, if your home is not also a place where people can come, where your neighbors can come, where your friends can come, then we're missing something. And I know I'm super extroverted, okay? So I know you introverts out there are like, you don't know who you're talking to. I'm not saying every night. I'm not saying all the time. I'm just saying there is possibility here. How do we make an opening? Invite people in our homes. Have dinner. Put your phone away when you're at the dinner table and get to know the people who are sitting across from you. How do we make an opening? Use our backyards. Let kids run around and play and have a good time. How do we make an opening? Do some road trips. Yesterday, me and a few neighbors, we made a pilgrimage up to High West in Park City. We had great food. We had great drinks. We had great company. And we just enjoyed each other. Some of these guys are not ready to be here. I've invited them. I'm going to keep inviting them. But they're ready to do that. That's how we make an opening. Go hiking. Don't go hiking solo. There are ways to make an opening. The front church, we want to be a place where because they couldn't get their friend to Jesus because of the crowd, so they made an opening. We want to be a church that's helping you make openings. Because... An encounter with Jesus is so important. So yes, people move slow. I wish they were here sooner. I wish the room was already packed. But what can we do? Well, we're doing a picnic after church. That wasn't just for you guys. I'm glad you're here. I hope you enjoy the pizza. But that's, we do things like that so that you have an opportunity to invite people to also be a part of that. Hey, my church is doing, I'm going to church and I'm going to picnic afterwards. You should come. That's that's part of the deal. Um, we're dreaming this summer about maybe the possibility of some women's brunches. Where, yeah, someone's excited about that. Um, where you can hang out. And the purpose of that, again, is not just for the women of the front church. 
The purpose is that we create a space where we make openings so that we can bring our friends, so that our friends who are not ready to show up here on Sundays can rub shoulders with other people at the front church, and then they meet other people besides you who come, and they think, I could, I could maybe go there. They seem all right. They don't seem like weirdos. Maybe they do. I don't know. Maybe the Lord gave us too much crazy, but we got things. Can I tell you one of the biggest things I'm excited about? Our Jesus Adventure Kids Camp coming to this high school the third week in July, July 19th through the 22nd. We're going to blast our neighborhood with flyers. We're going to tell everyone to bring a bunch of kids. We, we're, we're praying for 50 kids at our Jesus Adventure Kids Camp where kids are going to learn about Jesus. They're going to have a great time from 9 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. Monday through Thursday morning. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be amazing. Why are we doing that? To make an opening. Are you seeing a theme here this morning? We tell our friends, you should come. No, thanks. Okay, we're going to make an opening. We're not going to let the no be their final answer. We're going to make an opening. Cultural connection in Utah is off the charts low. Things will take time. But since we cannot get whoever your friend is, whoever your family member is, whoever your kiddo is, whoever your neighbor is, whoever your coworker is, since we could not get them to Jesus because they had some barriers, we are people who make openings. What roof are we tearing up, you guys? Who needs to ask Jesus for a little extra dose of crazy? Who needs to remember that Jesus is the thing our friends need more than anything else. More than anything else, to encounter an encounter with the living God, who when you come to him, you could be someone like the woman we, we read about last week, who's marked by community shame, and when you come to him, he can shift something inside you and you can be made new. He's ready to forgive. He's not far away like some of us have been led to believe. Like he's just waiting for us to get all our stuff together before he's like, okay, that's not how Jesus works. He's ready to embrace. He's right here. He's closer than your very breath. And he's ready to breathe life into our souls and into the souls of our friends, our family members, our coworkers, our kiddos, our classmates, our neighbors. No crowd, no roof. It's going to stand in his way. And we're going to pray it's not going to stand in our way either. Let's pray.